Good afternoon, everyone who are seated here at the boardroom and BSI office in WCC. Also, all our auxiliaries offices and all those who join us through YouTube as well as as well as YouTube live streaming. So today is a very significant day uh, in the history of the Bible Society of India, not only for the Bible Society of India, but also for the United Bible Societies across the world. As far as we know, this program which we are having an inaugural lecture on Mary John's public lecture. Uh, it seems the Bible Society of India is the first Bible Society who is having this program as part of our Bible Society movement. And to add to this value, Today, February 21, 2023, is also marked as a 212th anniversary of the existence of Bible Society, way back in February 11, 1811, in West Bengal, Calcutta. So for the family of the Bible Society, not only the staff working in the office, but to the whole churches who are engaging and who are partners in the ministry of the Bible Society for all of us today is a very, very significant and important day as well. This day, The Mary John's public lecture is not uh, the outcome of just a day or a week thought. This thought has been within us from last year, for the last past year, when the department of, one of the departments of the Bible Society of India, Church Relations and Resource Mobilization, the nomenclature is changed into Department of Church, Public Relations and Resource Mobilization. And this thought, what could be one of the best way that we could engage in a public square, the Bible Society and our ministry? Then this thought came, why don't we institute this Mary John's public lecture, an event? every year. And when the executive committee of the BSI discuss about this, when could this day be done in every year? It was decided that February 21 will be the right day to have this lecture. So today, this is the opening and it is a, uh, Great time for us, for the Bible Society of India. Let us all rejoice and be glad to what God is being doing so far in the ministry of Bible Society of India. May I now invite Mr. Caleb Martin, the Associate Director, Media and Special Audience Department, to have an opening prayer for this program. Let us pray. Creator God, our dear Heavenly Father, what a joy and a privilege it is for us as a BSI family and even our partners and well-wishers all around this nation and probably through virtually even from other nations joining together at this moment 
to celebrate your goodness, your faithfulness in this vision that you have carried all along. We are privileged this moment to even part of this celebration. Father, we thank you for Mary Jones, her life and her passion for your word. We thank you for your word that still inspires and transforms lives, communities. But at this moment, Lord, we are also aware, in spite of passing through 212 years, there are still many Mary Joneses who are longing to have a copy of your word. As we come together to celebrate and at the same time to understand the challenges what we are going through and how we can face this. We pray, Lord, that you may use this time, take this time to refresh us, to reform us, and to renew us so that we can recommit ourselves at this moment for the cause of your word. We pray let, this, let your presence be with us throughout this program in each and everything that we do and as we listen to the lecture. We commit ourselves and this time, giving you all the glory that you only deserve. And we commit ourselves and this time ahead of us. As we spend this moment, knowing that you will minister to us, for we ask this prayer. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So today's in our event, Mary John's public lecture. The title for the lecture is Mary Jones and her Bible, Contemporary Missiological Challenges. Before we have this lecture, we are going to have a short time, a short time to release BSI Bible app. I would like to invite Reverend Dr. Along Jamir, who is the Translation Department Director, to introduce to us about this, which we are going to release. So after his introduction, I invite our General Secretary, Reverend Dr. Emani Chako, General Secretary to release this BSI Bible app, which is a new one. Respected President, Madam, Reverend Dr. Lilawati Bemori and the officers, our beloved General Secretary, Reverend Dr. Mani Chako, uh, the senior management team here, the auxiliary secretaries from all over the country, our friends, guests, and our colleagues. Before I invite our beloved General Secretary to come over and do the release of the Bible Society of India Bible app, I just want to put on record, uh, recognizing the support, the encouragement that we have received while working as a team. We are indebted to the leadership of the Bible Society of India, the president and the officers, and particularly to our beloved General Secretary for his constant encouragement and for his fullest support in all the little, little things that we attempted as a team. Today, as Dr. Chungi said, this is a very historical moment for all of us. And I really felt that this is a very apt moment for all of us to engage ourselves into this new digital platform where 
we can engage uh, the people with the word of God. With the permission of the executive board who has granted us to release five language text. Today, in the Bible, the BSI Bible app that we are featuring, we are able to provide the four languages, the Aunaga, Complete Bible, the Apatani, New Testament, the Dimasa, New Testament, with Psalms and Proverbs, and the Tenede Bible. Unfortunately, because of the corrections that are being undertaken, we are unable to feature the Manipuri Bible. Hopefully, with the permission of the executive board, we will be able to provide all the languages that we have, whether it is in the form of the text, whether it is in the form of audio, or whether it is in the form of video, we will be able to feature this. I think every app that comes as a first time comes in the form of a beta version. And so this is something like this uh, for us to really test and try out, receive enough feedback so that we can improvise ourselves, build upon ourselves, and then work towards uh, with all the feedback that we receive from the readers. And so with these few words, uh, thanking God for his leading, for the way that he has blessed us as a team, I would like to now invite our beloved General Secretary to come over here and do the release of the Bible Society of India Bible app for the very first time. Uh, my dear colleagues, both uh, within the country and those who are virtually attending the session, uh, it has been a long cherished dream and desire to have our own Bible Society of India app. We live in a digital age, and one of the questions that had been put to me during my travels abroad and international meetings, is Bible Society of India being the largest Bible society in the fellowship of 150 Bible societies? How come you don't have an app of your own, especially today being the digital age? And I have been encouraging my colleagues, both the translation and the media and other colleagues, to explore the possibilities of having our own app. And I am so excited that today it is becoming a reality. And I want to congratulate and I want to thank the in different languages, four different languages now, but more languages will be there in the future with the permission of the executive board. And it's indeed my prayer that this Bible app would become a source of blessing for the transformation of many lives in the days to come. With these few words, it's indeed my privilege to inaugurate the Bible Society of India app. Thank you, sir. Before I hand over the time to Dr. Chungi, uh, we have a two minute video presentation on the demo of this app. For those of you who are just eagerly waiting for this, you may please log into our website. And when you log in, the first page that you will see is the featuring of this app. You can immediately download this in your mobiles. And uh, when you try out some of those features, you can immediately share it with your friends through WhatsApp and the other platforms. We hope you will appreciate this. Continue to support us 
and we will try to give our best in making the Bible available to reach across different groups of people. Misual de kong po ding ay lova. Musit. God is good. So he gave us, God is giving us this opportunity to read the Bible through the BSI Bible app. As we look forward to listen to the lecture on Mary Jones and her Bible, Contemporary Missiological Challenges. The first lecture as discussed for the past one year will be delivered by our dear General Secretary, Reverend Dr. M. Mani Chako. For many of us, we know him well, his background, and today, some of us who attend this meeting for the benefit of those who are new to the movement of Bible society, I would like to read out the shortest possible version of the profile of our General Secretary. Reverend Dr. Emmani Chako is an ordained minister of the Church of South India and has served congregations in Bangalore, Calcutta, and Chennai. Apart from serving as a priest at the parish of John Cable Church of the Church of England, London, in UK. Dr. Chako is an academician among theologians. After his theological studies at the United Theological College, Bangalore, he earned his PhD in Biblical Studies from King's College, University of London, under the mentorship of Professor Ronald E. Clemens, all those who studies, who are students of Biblical Studies. 
you cannot miss the book written, many books written by Ronald E. Clemens. Prior to assuming the directorship of the Ecumenical Christian Center, Whitefield, Bangalore in 2006, he served as principal of the Gurkhal Lutheran Theological College and Research Institute, Chennai. He taught there for 16 long years from 1990 and was professor and head of the department Old Testament studies before being appointed as principal of the college. He also taught at Sarampur College prior to his doctoral studies. As a biblical scholar, he was a visiting professor to several institutions, including the Faculty of Theology, University of Oslo, Norway, and the United Theological College, Parramatta, Sydney, Australia. Currently, he also serves a number of other organizations in an honorary capacity. To mention a few, he is presently a member of the Executive Board and the Association of St. Christopher's College of Education, Chennai, Women's Christian College, Chennai, Madras Christian College, Chennai, and also Research Ethics Committee, Hindustan Unilever Limited. Apart from being an external examiner for the University of Wales and of the University of Madras, he also served as a chaplain of the Order of Sisters of the Church of South India. Reverend Dr. Emmani Chaka has been published widely in several academic journals in India and abroad. He also has five books to his credit, Liberation and Service of God, Contemporary Reflections on the Faith of Our Mothers and Fathers, Thorn to Cyprus and Briar to Myrtle, and the last one recently, Inspired to Inspire. As an ecumenical thinker, he has addressed conferences and consultations in different forums in India and abroad. Currently, Reverend Dr. Amani Chako serves as the General Secretary of the Bible Society of India since August 2011. The largest Bible society among the 150 Bible societies spread over 200 countries around the world and serves on several committees of the United Bible Societies. To this, we know how the thought and the thinking pattern of RGS and the presentation, for some, it may be a little difficult to understand in the beginning because of its theological you know, languages, but if we all are giving a very keen listening ear, he always uses as simple as possible the terms and the languages. So we are so happy, sir, today that for this inaugural lecture of Mary John's public lecture will be delivered by you. May I invite you now? And before that, uh, at the end of his lecture, if we have certain uh, points, for a clarification or wanting to know more about what it is. So we will invite you and you can bring up your points for further discussion. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon here in India and uh, others from other parts of the world, if they are, you are with us, whatever time, let me wish you all a good time of listening and interaction. Respected President of the Bible Society of India, Dr. Leelavati Vimuri, the members of the Executive Committee who are present at this meeting, all my dear colleagues, within the country and from the UBS and many friends from different Bible societies, auxiliaries within the country and my dear friends and colleagues in God's mission. Many a time 
Bible is a term which has become very much part of us. And many a time we have taken this term or this book Bible very lightly. We have taken it for granted. And many a time Bible has become cause for division and disunity even within the church. It is in this kind of a context. I have been thinking a lot about the role of the Bible in the public square or in the marketplace. When you go to a church on a Sunday, you have the Bible in your pew. And you have many Bibles, many copies of different types of Bibles in your homes. And many a time, none of those Bibles in your homes have been even looked at. It is very safely kept in the shelves. And at times, you read certain texts of the Bible and spend time by way of devotion. But then I was asking myself the question, what is the Bible really? Is it a private statement or is it a public document? I've gone through different phases in my life journey theological education for more than 30 years, ecumenical exposure and experience for more than six or seven years. And now heading the largest Bible society in the United Bible Societies, the Bible Society of India for the last 12 years. I've been convinced again and again and again to reiterate this statement which I have just made, that Bible is a public document. It's not only to be regarded merely as a private statement. The more you regard Bible as a private statement, the less you regard Bible as a public document. Bible to me is a private statement. It does help me a lot in my devotional life, in my spiritual nurture, in my journey of life. But it also is a public document addressing the varied issues my neighbor faces, whoever he or she may be. And therefore, in one of the executive board meetings, I proposed to the executive board members. This same statement I repeated there again, Bible is not just a private statement, but it is a public document and how we, the Bible Society of India, can make this statement come alive, that Bible is a public document and not merely a private statement. And two proposals I made in the executive board, one is to change the nomenclature of one of our very significant departments, Church Relations and Resource Mobilization Department into Church Public Relations and Resource Mobilization Department. Formerly, the focus was only on the church and resource mobilization. Now, the focus is on the church, public relations and resource mobilization. And then a second proposal I made to the executive board, and that was to revisit the history behind the Bible Society movement, particularly the story of Mary Jones. And then I proposed that we have an annual Mary Jones public lecture, inviting people of repute 
from within the society, not necessarily from within the church alone, but from within the society at large, to come and deliver a lecture, either virtually or physically. To begin with, we are doing it virtually, but then later on, it may become a physical lecture may not be only in Bangalore, but in different places within the country. But the inaugural lecture is a virtual lecture which we're having today. And I propose this suggestion that we have a Mary Jones public lecture. And it was the Church Public Relations and Resource Mobilization Department. My colleague, Dr. Chungi and others have proposed, why don't we have this lecture on the 21st of February because it was on the 21st of February, way back in 1811, Bible Society of India came into existence. And I thought it was a very welcome proposal. And I again brought it to the notice of the executive board. They unanimously accepted the proposal. And that is why we are here today to have the first Mary Jones public lecture. And I deem it a great honor and privilege to be asked to deliver the first Mary Jones public lecture as the General Secretary of the Bible Society of India. The title of this lecture is Mary Jones and Her Bible, Contemporary Missiological Challenges. As my colleague, Dr. Chungi has already told you, some of these statements which I'm going to make and some of these terminologies which I may be using may be of little disturbance to you and may not be very clear to you to begin with. But this document will be available in our website and later on in the sewing circle. And thereby you could digest more as you get a chance to read this document more clearly in your private time. But then I have been thinking a lot about the title of my first lecture as to what it should be. And then this thought after a long time of discussion within my mind and interaction within myself, I came to this title, Mary Jones and her Bible, Contemporary Missiological Challenges. What I'm proposing to do this afternoon is to begin the lecture by revisiting the story of Mary Jones and her passion for the Bible. And after that, I will attempt to deal with the contemporary missiological challenges in the light of the Bible. Bala, some of you must have heard about the name of this town, Bala. It's a small town in North Wales. And this small town became famous because that was the town where Reverend Thomas Charles lived, from whom Mary got her Bible in her own heart language. Mary Jones, as most of you have read about, was born in December 1784 into a poor Welsh family. Her father was a weaver. Her parents were Calvinistic Methodists, and Mary herself became a Christian at the age of eight. They lived at the foot of the Calderdris Mountain, North Wales, and Mary learned to read in schools organized by Reverend Thomas Charles from Bala, who had a passion for teaching children. burning desire as time went on to possess a Bible on her own. It was a vain hope, but money was scarce and Welsh Bibles were hard to come by. The nearest place to buy one Bible was Bala, which was 25 miles away from her village. And it was not even certain that a copy would be, could be bought there. 
even if she had enough money. Although she did not have enough money, she was bent on having a Bible of her own and therefore she started saving money for long six years. And eventually she had enough money to buy a Bible. One morning in 1800, Mary set out to buy her Bible. It was 25 miles to Bala and she went barefoot as usual through the rugged roads. Today when you go to Bala, there is a beautiful road which is known as Mary Jones Walk. You can go through that beautiful road today which is not that rugged just to get a feel of what Mary Jones would have gone through. Mary Jones' journey to Bala took her through valleys, across streams and mountains. And eventually she came to Bala and to the home of Reverend Thomas Charles, the only man with the Bibles for sale in the town. But all the copies Reverend Thomas Charles had were either sold or spoken for, for other people. She was completely heartbroken and Mary wept. Her despair touched Reverend Thomas Charles, who sold her one of the copies, which was already promised to another. According to another version of the story, Mary was accommodated by Reverend Thomas Charles till the next set of Bibles arrived from London, and Thomas Charles gave her three copies of the Bible for the price of one. And she was overjoyed and returned home. Now this little girl's visit profoundly impacted Thomas Charles. He began to wonder what could be done for others, such as Mary, for people who long for the Bible around the world. He proposed to the Council of the Religious Tract Society to form a new society to supply Wales with the Bibles. And in 1804, the British and Foreign Bible Society was established in London. The British and Foreign Bible Society, often known in England today simply as the Bible Society, is a non-denominational Christian Bible Society with charity status and whose purpose is to make the Bible available throughout the world. The Society was formed on 7th March 1804 by a group of people, including William Wilberforce, Reverend Thomas Charles, Mr. William Pitt, and so on, to encourage the wider circulation and user use of scriptures. As all of us know, today the Bible Society movement has grown to a worldwide fellowship of 150 Bible societies spread over 250 countries under the banner of the United Bible Societies, the UBS. The Bible Society of India, as I told already, is the largest and one of the oldest of all the Bible societies in the world. And hence the Bible Society of India has and plays a significant role in the global fellowship of the United Bible Societies. Now having revisited the history of Mary Jones or the story of Mary Jones and her passion for the Bible, let me go to the second major part of the paper, and that is the contemporary missiological challenges. Now I was thinking, as I was preparing the second section of my presentation, what did Mary, what did Bible mean for Mary, really? Mary must have been, must have heard a number of sermons, priests, from the pulpit in her church, and she would have learned a number of stories which Reverend Thomas Charles would have taught in the schools. And she would have had the desire to know more about those stories or those sermons which she would have listened to Sunday by Sunday. 
And therefore, she had the desire to possess the Bible for her own, so that she could read the Bible at leisure and try to understand what the Bible is talking about. Now, the context of Mary Jones is radically different from the context you and I are facing today. Today, we are living in a world of chaos and confusion. Challenges such as pandemics, wars, violence, earthquakes, floods, victimization of the vulnerable, corruption at all levels, anti-conversion bills, etc., etc., have become the order of the day. It is in such a context that we are called to take the Bible to the public square, to promote the values of the God of the Bible, that is love, justice, forgiveness, peace, and reconciliation. We cannot keep the Bible any longer just in our churches and in our homes. We need to take the Bible to the marketplace, to the public square, where there is violence, where there are wars, where there is corruption, and so on and so forth. In order to address these challenges of the day, we need to make certain transpositions of power, as we call it, as I call it, which we have been practicing since our childhood. And these are transpositions from the faith which I had inherited from my own parents. I'm personalizing it. You may apply it to your own selves. Transposition is a word which simply means changing your position from one to the other. And that is why we call it as transposition. And many a time, right from our childhood, we had inherited faith from our parents, from our Sunday school teachers, from our Bible study groups, from our youth fellowship meetings, and from massive evangelistic campaigns. And these are transpositions which I had also learned in the seminary where I began my theological education in the 70s. These are transpositions which arose out of a necessity to relate faith to life. These are transpositions which arose as a result of the deep knowledge of the Bible, cultures, peoples, and faith, which made me realize that there is something fundamentally wrong in our theology and theological formulations because our theology often functions as a tool to further division and discord instead of unity and harmony. You don't have to look anywhere else except your own churches to understand what I just stated. Many a time I have realized that the theological prepositions we have inculcated in us from time immemorial actually contradict the biblical God and God's purposes for God's creation and very seldom deal with the issues of our context, of our times. Therefore, it is mandatory that we revisit our present theological transpositions, which we have inherited from our younger days, and try to reconstruct new theological and missiological transpositions, which will serve as transpositions of transformation of power in order to make theology or missiology a life science and not merely a God talk. For me, theology or missiology today in our churches has become merely a God talk, not a life science. I would like to propose five transpositions which we need to make in order to bring out the significance of the Bible in the marketplace or the public square. As I said in the beginning, these transpositions which I'm going to propose may be disturbing to some. But I'm sure most of us would find these transpositions 
extremely useful in order to address the various challenges we face from time to time in our context. Now, let me go to these five transpositions, which I would like to propose. The first transposition which we need to make is the transposition from absolute to relational. Absolute to relational. Not relative, but relational. Absolute to relational. Now, let me explain this a bit. Every faith is absolute for its adherence. If you ask a Muslim, his faith is absolute for him or for her. If you ask a Hindu, his faith or her faith is absolute for him or for her. And they will naturally make absolute claims for their faith, which is legitimate as far as they are concerned. However, affirming our faith in Christ and God's revelation in Christ does not mean negating God's revelation in and among other peoples. The church's mission is not to destroy such absolute faith claims, but to challenge and to be challenged by them in mutuality and complementarity. It is with this shift from absolute to relational that we move forward or we need to move forward. Any God talks belongs to this language. Even the centrality and the uniqueness of Christ is also a mystery. When faith claims are seen in this light, we realize the beauty of the language of mystery, which always has the dimension of the beyond which transcends all human understanding. For me, the word mystery has been a very helpful word in this endeavor. The concept of mystery helps me realize that God is God and I am human, that God is beyond reason, that the values connected to the reign of God are eternal and permanent. That experience of God is not sympathy, an aesthetic phenomenon, but rather an experience of ethical relationships of justice and peace. It also helped me to understand that God is both an individual and a communitarian experience. The point I would like to emphasize is that knowledge is based on multiple experiences. And because of this plurality of experiences, sometimes I wonder whether there can be absolute knowledge. And this is particularly significant in our own country, in India, where people are exposed to different religious experiences and traditions. The challenge to Christian witnessing in the Indian context is to realize that the core of the gospel we are called to proclaim is the dignity and honor of human personhood. This becomes a reality only when we are able to accept the other the way he or she is. In order to accept the other and to accept the difference, theology at times should change its universal, fixed, absolute categories of knowledge and values and reorient its theoretical basis to accept the validity of values, multiple values and practices. Our theologies and thereby our witness needs to be relational with respect to individuals, communities, genders, races, and all creation, resisting all efforts to subsume the difference or drift away from one another. So absolute to relational is the first transposition which we need to make in order to address the challenges we are facing today in the light of our understanding of the God of the Bible. A second transposition, which I would like to propose, is the transposition from redemption to creation. Redemption to creation. Theologians in the West especially teach that creation is steadily narrowed down to Christ 
And from Christ, it extends out to a new creation. And we call that as the salvation history. Now, it is a West-centric interpretation of history. Rather, it is a Western Christianity-centric interpretation of Christ. It is supposed to explain what God had done for the whole humanity, but in fact, it explains it away. Religion basically has become a means to save one's soul, and Christianity is no exception. Redemption becomes the part, principal part of religion, every, especially Christian religion. It is the main concern of Christianity. Even a casual acquaintance with the teachings and the doctrines of the Christian church makes it very evident that religion's main preoccupation is catered to this very human need, is understandable, that saving one's soul. But when almost all what one believes and does in religion is focused only on saving one's soul to the exclusion of the other concerns. To me, religion becomes distorted and becomes even abused. I strongly feel that what has been missing in Christianity in its teachings and doctrines is creation. Most of us do recognize the importance of creation, but most of the time we only pay lip service to it. How do we correct this mistake of one-sided emphasis on redemption? By giving creation a, a place it deserves in our faith and theology, bringing about the transposition from redemption to creation. In fact, as a matter of fact, without creation, nothing happens, not even redemption. Kindly think through it, what I'm trying to say. It may not be immediately understandable, as a matter of fact, without creation, nothing happens, not even redemption. If creation is not played on the stage, even redemption cannot take place. It's a mystery, therefore, that in Christian theology, creation has become an appendix, an asterisk, an afterthought, a bracket, happening only at the beginning of time and history and at the end of time and history. The entire bulk of faith and theology has been the massive concentration on redemption. In this way, creation is often treated as a mere addendum. The so-called natural theology or theology of nature or theology of creation is normally considered as a theological anomaly. But what is interesting is you look at the church outside the Christian church for a while, for a moment. Let us get off to our, of our own respective churches and go into the marketplace, into the public square and interact with, with the public and see what they are doing. Nature and by extension creation plays a dominant part in people's lives. Getting out of bed in the morning, one is greeted by nature. Lunar calendar is meticulously followed by most people, urban and rural, particularly by farmers as they calculate sowing times and harvesting times. People are very aware they live at the mercy of nature, depending upon heaven for their livelihood. Nature or creation is part and parcel of their lives. They have respect for nature. They're born from nature, live on nature and return to nature. And that is why they venerate nature, sometimes worshipping it. But many a times we do not understand why they worship nature. In many cases, what they worship is not nature itself, but rather the supreme being that brought nature into existence. And this factor is something which we have often overlooked or forgotten. It has taken many centuries for some Christians or all of us to realize how important nature or creation is for their lives from one generation to another. Today, even in the West in which conquest, in which conquest of nature has played a decisive role, 
People have at last come to realize nature or creation is not to be regarded as an enemy to be manipulated and defeated, but to be protected and nurtured. My dear friends, human being has to learn to live with nature or creation. For human being depends on nature, creation, much more than nature or creation on human being. In actual fact, a human being cannot live without nature or creation, but nature or creation can happily live without a human being. So my dear friends, redemption is meaningless without nature or creation. Of course, nature or creation need to be repaired. It needs to be recreated. And recreation goes on all the time. Recreation of creation to me is redemption. As recreation goes on all the time, so does redemption also goes on all the time. I have realized after a long struggle that the transposition from redemption to creation and creation, recreation as redemption would bring about fundamental changes in what we believe and how we do theology. Implications of this, this realization for what is known as Christian missions would be enormous and far-reaching. At least it will bring about fundamental shifts from Christian mission as the Christianity-centered, Christian church-dominated, conversion-focused operation to creation-oriented, nature-friendly, culture-oriented ventures with God the Creator, Redeemer at the heart of all. The second transposition, redemption to creation. And when I use the word transposition from one to the other, I'm not undermining either. I'm only proposing that we need to transpose from one to the other in order to face the challenges. The third transposition, which is a very, very important transposition that we need to make. If you don't understand what I'm trying to propose, you need to reread or re-listen to what I'm trying to communicate. But it's a very important transposition which we would like to make and we need to make in order to address the challenges of our times. One question I would like to raise at this moment is about Christ. Does Christ unite? or divide? Am I wrong if I say that there are many Christs? Christ created by the Orthodox Church, Christ created by the Roman Catholic Church, Christ created by the Protestant Church of many denominations, and each one claiming to be that their Christ is the authentic Christ. The question that needs to be asked is, whose Christ is the authentic Christ? Whose Christ represents that Jesus who walked on the earth 2,000 years ago in Palestine? Look at South Africa. For many centuries, the majority of black South Africans were ruled and exploited by the small minority of white Europeans. We do not have to go into the heartbreaking stories of black South Africans under the white European rule. The Christ brought to South Africa was a white Christ, the Christ of the oppressors. The Christ of black South Africans was a black Christ, the Christ of the oppressed. When political turmoil erupted, resulting in the black rule having replaced the white rule, it was a conflict between the white Christ and the black Christ. The question I would like to pose here is, where was Jesus in this conflict between the white Christ and the black Christ, between the Orthodox Christ and the Catholic Christ? Jesus was not neutral. Jesus, who always took the side of the oppressed and exploited, must have taken the side of the black South Africans fighting for their human dignity and political independence. Christ 
against Christ. It is also true in the conflicts within Christianity and between Christianity and other religions. From the onset of Christianity, tribes of different churches have quarreled with each other. They called each other heretics and engaged in mutual excommunication. And in extreme cases, they put each other even to death in the name of their Christ. Had this Christ anything to do with the Jesus of Nazareth? Isn't it alarming that there is one Jesus but countless Christ? Getting to know who Jesus is has to be at the heart of our theological and missiological endeavors. I know the risks involved in making this transition from Christ to Jesus, but I have to make it. Making the transposition from Christ to Jesus compels me to reconstruct my faith in theology. I have to make many detours in my theological journey, including my theological methods and contents. But I must tell you, it has been a fascinating detour, and I continue to make them from Christ to Jesus. The Jesus of Nazareth, the Jesus who always sides with the oppressed, the marginalized, the vulnerable, the weak, and the downtrodden, always encourages me to take sides with the poor and the needy. And that brings meaning to me to my faith and to my, the God of the Bible. The fourth transposition, which I would like to propose, again, is an important transposition, if you may consider this, and that is people of God to peoples of God. People of God in the singular to peoples of God in the plural. This is yet another transposition I had to make in my journey of life. Our understanding of people of God is very narrow and often is confined only to Israel. Why? Because they are the chosen of God from among, among all peoples as described in the Old Testament. And also the self-understanding of the Christian community as described in the New Testament that is the church. Now this understanding or claim is made either out of ignorance of other people and of how they live, believe and die, or out of sheer arrogance. Christians reject it as dangerous to faith. If we reject other cultures and religions, how can we face seriously the multicultural, multi-ethnic nature of God's creation? Or are we just making a lip service to God's creation? The emergence of the people movements that arose in the recent times in Asia and in Latin America have made possible a new exploration of the biblical, theological, and political dimensions of the concept of the people of God. In the recent biblical scholarship, it indicates that the people of God referred to in the Bible was not a single tribe, but a motley group of marginalized, powerless, disfranchised people who were bound together by a common experience of oppression and injustice and by a common yearning for justice and freedom. This transposition from people of God to peoples of God had to be made for a different reason. It is not only Western Christian forms of faith and theology but the social and political reality of Palestine, of which Israel is a part. When we look at the past from the vantage point of the present, from the political conflicts between Israelis and Israelites and the Palestinians in Palestine today, to the Palestine believed by many Jews and Christians to be God's promised land, we know why transposition is important. For past half a century, Palestine was turned into a bloody battleground. To this day, peace is not in sight. The root of it all is the religious belief in the promised land. This has been the crux of the matter that has created untold human tragedies for the past several thousand years. 
The awareness of the religious roots of the endless bloody conflicts in Palestine today compelled me to shift the focus of my theological assumption from Israel as God's chosen race, enjoying special privileges over other races. Because everyone is created in God's own image, every individual, every race. And this transposition from people of God to peoples of God is thus a, not a matter of choice, but a fundamental necessity with many implications of how, how Christians should believe and do Christian theology. But the stake is so high that most Christian theologians, preachers and believers, and those of us who work in even Bible societies, either do not understand or we do not dare to take that step, to look at people around us, not as people of God, but as peoples of God. The fifth transposition, which I would like to make or propose in order to address these challenges in the light of the biblical God, is a mission of conquest to mission of hospitality. Mission of conquest to mission of hospitality. Now, it is with great pain that I am stating that the existing understanding of our mission or missiology, as we call it, does not bring justice to many sections of the people. Therefore, we need to look for an alternative missiology. The mission history shows the misuse of religion, especially Christianity as an instrument or agent protects to protect the interests of the rich and the colonial powers. Let me quote a few examples to prove the point. Since the time of the first ecumenical council of Nicaea, Christianity has consistently maintained religious legitimacy of the empire. Hence the council of Nicaea was convened and the council rejected and suppressed the claims and practice of the poor Christians and established religious hegemony of the empire at that time. Gradually, faith became an obligatory state religion to express loyalty to the empire. A second example, the history of Christian countries in the West shows that Christianity was used as an instrument to expand imperialism. You know, those who know the history of the church, the crusade was waged nine times by Christians against Muslims and Jews. Can you believe it? Nine times. Indigenous Christian communities were also not spared. The crusaders killed those who resisted and destroyed and confiscated crops and properties by force. The Western Christianity has been closely associated with colonial expansion. Using the military forces, Christianity was spread in Asia, Latin America and Africa. They considered colonial expansion to be providence of God, to bring good news to the heathen world. The colonizers not only invaded their territories, but also forcibly proselytized the people. Though some of the missionaries were critical of colonial interest, most missionaries conspired with the colonial governments and cooperated with them. It was in this imperial historical context that Edinburgh Conference, that world famous mission conference in 1910 took place. The conference was held under the patronage of colonial powers. The people who sent greetings to the Edinburgh Conference included the King of England, the President of the United States, and the rulers of colonial powers. The Edinburgh Conference clearly acknowledged that the colonial expansion was God's providence to evangelize the uncivilized and the barbaric people. The Edinburgh Conference co-opted the poor and the marginalized in the scheme of Western empire. Without much alteration, we simply followed the tradition set by the Edinburgh Conference all along. Often mission agencies or ecumenical movements act as agents of empire. Mission of God should not be reduced to ruling class movement to serve the needs of the empire, but rather it must take the position of and for the poor and must become the voice of the poor and exploited. 
It's in this context, I'm forced to remember our own bishop, Azariah, who in one of the mission conferences attended by colonial powers, got up and said, we appreciate your zeal, your enthusiasm to come to us with the gospel. We appreciate. But what we need is not your colonial attitude forcing us to be converted. But what we need is friends. You to be our friends. You to come to us to understand us, our context, the situation we live in, and to serve as friends, and to may not to make us exploited further, because we are already exploited. Make us friends, or give us friends. Bishop Azariah very powerfully voiced in one of the later mission conferences. My dear friends, we need a new missiological paradigm where God is perceived as a fellow sufferer, a great comforter, divine power, not as the dominating or controlling power, nor as a dialectical power in weakness, but as a liberating and transforming power that is effective in compassionate love, care, and service. We need a radical departure from the imperial theology of the missionary movement because their Christian values are used to support the rulers and oppressors and perpetuate an unmindful exploitation of earth's resources. One of the beautiful metaphors that has been helpful to me in the process of deepening my own understanding of theology and missiology is the image of the world as God's body the picture of the world as God's body. That famous biblical scholar by name Sally McFaig has remarked, this metaphor of the body encourages us to concentrate on the neighborhood, not just on ourselves, but on the neighborhood. It understands the doctrine of creation not to be primarily about God's power, but about God's love. How we can live together, all of us, within and for God's body. It focuses attention on the near, on the neighbor, on the earth, on meeting God not later in heaven only, but here and now. It is the creation of the world as God's body, united and rooted in God's love, which should be the goal of theology and missiology. And this only would definitely necessitate, and this would necessitate the theological transpositions which I have laid before you. The transposition, the five transpositions from absolute to relational, from redemption to creation, from Christ to Jesus, from people of God to peoples of God, and from mission of God mission of conquest to mission of hospitality. Mary Jones, we greatly remember this day, thanking God for her life and work and her, for her passion for the Bible. The question I would like to leave with is, do we have her passion in knowing the Bible and knowing the God of the Bible. If we have that kind of a passion of knowing the Bible and knowing the God of the Bible, we have to accept the reality that we have not fully understood the Bible and not the God of the Bible. We need to make these transpositions in order to understand really what the Bible really is and who the God of the Bible really is. Absolute to relational. Redemption to creation. Christ to Jesus. 
people of God to peoples of God, and mission of God to mission of hospitality. It's indeed my prayer and hope that as we have begun this Mary Jones public lecture, which will be held annually, that her passion for the Bible and for the God of the Bible would encourage us to understand the Bible and the God of the Bible in our own context and make necessary transpositions if needed to face the contemporary missiological challenges in order to make the world a better place to live in. With this Words of reflection, theological, missiological reflection, it is indeed my privilege to inaugurate the first Mary Jones public lecture initiated by the Bible Society of India. And it's my prayer that this annual series of lectures would become a source of inspiration to make Christianity more relevant to the context we are living in. God bless all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much indeed, sir, for that very, very powerful lecture on the power of God of the Bible from the life example of Mary Jones, connecting it to our contemporary challenges, bringing realities from different perspective, the need for the transformation from a transposition to a transformation, giving us five important steps from absolute to relational, from redemption to creation, from Christ to Jesus of Nazareth, people of God to peoples of God, mission of God to mission of hospitality. Indeed, it's powerful. As we move on, the Ministry of the Bible Society of India, sometimes it is very easy to lay back and be content with just the transposition we are experiencing without transformation. It can happen into our lives. As the lecture has given us a very good challenge in front of us. Whether the minister of the Bible Society will continue to journey on with the passion of Mary Jones, I think that is a very important challenge, which we need to continue this passion while bringing Bible to people, this passion should be our light. This passion should also be our passion. The mission of God is what the mission of the Bible Society of India. The Bible Society of India is the product of the mission, God's mission. There, we need to stay firm and we need to remember that the ministry of Bible Society is the mission of God. So now I may invite uh, from, uh, you can, if you have any question in a very short form, uh, if you have any uh, clarity, uh, clarification, 
kindly unmute your audio while we all are here, while GS is here. So we will invite a few feedback and reflection, or if it is in the form of question. So may I now open the floor for everyone. Kindly unmute if you want to raise or if you want to give your feedback. Open to you. from this boardroom also everyone all are invited this is a very helpful lecture and i appreciate web society of india uh, it was in new dimension in the uh, and my suggestion is that how it can reach to the uh, the level of church or to the member to understand this new theology or new thoughts that has emerged. Thank you. Um. Uh, it's not audible properly, Mr. Uh, Ashokma. Um, can you repeat yeah. again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. But uh, it is a new inaugurate one's uh, BSI app. It is a new uh, technology to the modern society, no doubt. But uh, the printing of the Bibles in uh, in uh, Book form it will be, uh, it will your voice is broken or disclose uh, uh, that form as the question and also, yeah can, 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 is it possible to type it to type it on that to chat box this up the down to the levels. Uh, Mr. Ashokmar, I'm sorry to say that your voice is broken. Uh, is it possible to type your question on the chat box so that we will read it out? Yeah. So as we are waiting for Mr. Ashokmar's question uh, in the chat box, so can we can we have some more response from the audience? I think Mr. Ashok Kumar's uh, question was uh, linking with the uh, um, app bible app bible app with the printing uh, the actual question we could not get is it the question or oh. maybe you just try to try to say something uh if if we have just uh, understood your question, uh, I think the question was related to something like if and when we have the Bible in an app, will it affect the print? Well, researchers have clearly shown that actually 
you print more even when we have the digital platform. Uh, people's attachment towards the hard copy, I think, gets more uh, stronger. And even when they have the Bible in a digital format in their mobile, uh, we have noticed that there's a clear indication of the raise in demands for the print Bibles. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Can you uh, I think this uh, from Christy. Uh, there's a question: Is the Bible absolute authority or relational? I think this question will go to Jess. Yeah, I think that is one of the transpositions which I have proposed: that the Bible from absolute to relational. And I also made a statement that all these transpositions which I proposed, I'm not denying either or this one or that. It's transposition from one position to the other. Now, when you confine our understanding of God only as absolute, we have the tendency to be exclusive in our understanding of God and thereby in understanding of the other. We don't even make an attempt to understand the other or to be enriched by the other. But for me personally, understanding people of other faiths have enabled me to understand the God of the Bible much more clearly and much more with much more clarity. And many a time when we focus more on the absoluteness of God, of the Bible, we seldom relate to the people of other faith communities. And I don't think that is what the absoluteness of God of the Bible wants us to be engaged in. God of the Bible, God is still absolute, which cannot be denied. God is absolute. But then that absoluteness, how do you and I know? It is through relationality with people of other faith communities and with people of our neighborhood and people right there in the marketplace. So there is an interconnectivity between absoluteness and relationality. If I've understood your question correctly, and if I've, I've tried to answer you. Yeah, yeah, Ms. Ashok, now we are clear. Uh, if, we, if we spread out the app, and will it not, uh, stop, uh, you know, the printing. I think this is not what uh, it will be, as our uh, Dr. Along had already responded to that. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Chrissy, for your question and the response. I hope you will be happy to hear that. Um, okay. Um, is there any more clarity that we want to? Uh, in case, if you would like to have a more conversation on this, uh, you're always welcome uh, to send your queries to our uh, email. Or if you will have, we will, we will open another few more minutes if we have a few more feedback. Yes, madam. Is it Madam President? Or Sumita? Yes. Uh, can you yes. hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Right. So uh, I just wanted to make a, a few comments on Dr. Charco's lecture. Uh, one of the points that he made is finds a lot of resonance in contemporary issues, and that is his reference to nature, because now the Bible is being read from an ecological point of view. And you know, that takes on, especially in our times when there is whole issues of climate change, the reading of the Bible from a particular point of view, which is an ecological reading, a green reading, is extremely important. So I found that particular point that Dr. Chaco had made was very relevant. Another point which uh, 
has a lot of resonance for me, especially, is about not just tolerating difference, but it is about respecting difference. And here, there is the community, I think, is a little guilty of some sense of arrogance when you, you feel that you are in a position which is superior and you are in a position where you are to tell the others, you know, what is the good news. And that is not the right attitude at all. So when Dr. Chako refers to relational, particularly in India, which is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-language society, this particular point is of great relevance. So I, I would like to congratulate Dr. Chako of having brought these into the line of vision in his very first lecture, because these are things that we can't afford to ignore. We need to reflect and think about them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, your point is very, very well accepted and appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm. Um, okay, um, okay, we will continue with our um, program line up here. As we have heard the presentation and the feedback and many more, I know that in our hearts, in our thoughts, it will continue to inspire, um, but maybe due to the time constraint. So we will come to our closing prayer. Now, may I now invite Dr. Mrs. Lilavati Vemuru, president of the BSI, to have a closing prayer after this, soon after that. I would like to invite Reverend Dr. Vanal Ava, the President, BSI, Aizol Auxiliary. Over to you, Madam President. Okay, shall we pray? A gracious, loving Heavenly Father, thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity you have given us to listen to a wonderful lecture from Reverend Dr. Mani Chako, the General Secretary of Bible Society of India. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the, for the privilege you have given us, O oh Lord, to open the Bible app already with four languages, O oh Lord. Bless this Bible app, O oh Lord. Let the people use this Bible app and let them be blessed by using this Bible app, O oh Lord. Let it be a great blessing to the people who are living in darkness. And I also pray for the opportunity you have given us, O oh Lord, to revisit the story of a poor Welsh girl, Mary Jones, and her passion to have her own Bible in her own heart's language. Thank you, Lord, for making us to listen to the lecture by Reverend Dr. Chako. Thank you, Jesus. Help, maybe we are not facing the same kind of situations what Mary Jones faced in her days, O Lord, but still we have some problems, O Lord. And help us, O Lord, to come out of those problems and to make the make your word available to all the people, O Lord, in all the heart languages. Help us, O Lord, <clears throat> make this Bible as a public document, O Lord, not as private statement. Thank you, Jesus for this wonderful message that you have given through your servant, O Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the contributions 
that are made by your children, O Lord. And I also pray, O Lord, let the zeal and the passion of Mary Jones, let it be in the hearts of many people in India and also in the world at large, so that we can take the Bible into the hands of the people and into the places where it is not there, O Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the people who have made this possible, O Lord, to start this Mary Jones Public Lecture from this year annually. Bless this program, O Lord. Let this program be a blessing to so many people in India and around the world. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. We may receive the benediction. Wow, uh, yeah, please unmute your mic. Yeah. May the grace and blessings of Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for your precious presence this afternoon your presence made it possible today's our important event inauguration of mary john's public lecture and our heartfelt thanks once again goes to our generous secretary we are very privileged to have our madam president dr mrs leela that was a great blessing. And to all our friends, those who join us within India and outside of our country, we see you and we acknowledge your presence. And to all our church members, our well-wishers, our important committee members, executive members, and auxiliaries, branch leaders, all of you, all our staff and our auxiliary, auxiliary secretaries, thank you so much for making it today. See you again next year at this date. <laughs> thank you.